words. That's going to be sure. great. And then we have um, Phoebe and Stephen joining us from Cornell, who are going to talk a little bit about their project on um, kind of looking at the social impact of um, low cost, high bandwidth and data for agriculture and how uh -huh. they might um, learn from this group actually as a group of early adopters. So Phoebe's uh -huh. going to talk about that project. And then Andrew, I think, is joining us. We really wanted Andrew to talk about some of the work he did over the summer, in particular doing like a closed loop. I think he was doing some irrigation, um, you know, some experimentation with irrigation um, that's going to be a closed loop system. So depending on how much time we have left over, we'll have Andrew give us a preview of how that went this summer. And then we've invited him to give a more formal presentation at one of our next community meetings. So welcome everybody. There's Andrew. I see he's in the lobby. We'll invite him. Um, and having that, some uh, computer issues. I'll hopefully be on video here shortly. <laughs> okay. Hey, Andrew. I was just I was just mentioning you. I'm glad you could join. And uh, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, and we'll record. I see Stacy. Thank you. Has already started recording the session, so we can make it available to those that can't join us. And um, Dennis, I did mention the um, meeting that's happening later this week at the, for the uh, Foundation of Food and Ag Research, the Unlocking Agricultural Data Revolution. I put a link to it, uh -huh. and I signed up. <laughs> it's like a great agenda. It so. That was one of the reasons we moved our community meeting this week, and I'm really looking forward to attending. So thank you. One of the folks on the call had a question about, is it too late to join? If you if you haven't already registered, can we still do that? I just had a call earlier this morning with Shafali. She's sort of, I call her the CCO, Chief Conference Organizer. <laughs> and uh, there have been a lot of people inquiring about that. So I would say go ahead and register. And then if you get the links, then you know you're in. But it's well over 450 at this point. So wow, it is a, of course, who knows? Because it's a free thing, and I'm sure at least one, maybe 100 or more of those free <laughs> registrants aren't actually going to show up. But yeah. yeah, I would say just go ahead and register. That's great. All right, you heard it from Dennis. You can still register <laughs> even after the deadline. So um, that's great. Thank you. All right, I will go ahead and turn it over to um, to Vikram to kick us off with an introduction to this new AI Institute that UIUC is going to be um, helping lead uh, for the digital agriculture revolution. <laughs> So I have not used Teams to share my screen before, so give me a moment to figure it out. Sure. Uh, In the top, you should see a uh, menu, and there's a little arrow in going uh, into a rectangular box, and that's yes. the screen sharing tool, and then you can pick which window yeah. you would like to share with the rest of us. Right. Interestingly, I'm not seeing the one that I want. I'm seeing six windows and not the one I want. Give me one second. Let me confirm. Right? <laughs> Everything changed for me. You guys can hear me now. Yeah, I think we can hear you. Oh, OK, good. Yeah, no, I was just saying that um, I opened up Teams today and all the controls were in different locations. So I was a little bit disoriented. Oh, that's interesting. Oh. <laughs> They're at the top hey, instead of the bottom. We like to keep things interesting and mix them up, <laughs> keep you on your toes. Yes, it's a, it's a test. <laughs> I'm it's the real-time product releases. It's exciting. <laughs> <laughs> um, you can also share your whole desktop. So if it's hard to find the window. OK, that um, might be the easiest thing to do. You can share your desktop and then just yeah. you know, quickly yeah. hide everything else. <laughs> That's okay. I, would, I trust all of you. You can read my email. <laughs> you can answer them. I can answer them while I'm talking. Save you time. <laughs> you just don't talk about us. Yeah. <laughs> oh, great. Uh, it used to be that I could reopen recent presentations, but instead, now I need to sign in. 
to a Microsoft account to do that. <laughs> Never mind. It's my, it's my bad. <laughs> um, and Vikram, you can always, if it's like proving difficult, uh, you can email Stacy and I or send them to me and I'll, I'll project them for you. Okay. But I think sharing my desktop seems to be working. So give me one second to open the file and I'll be ready to go. Okay, perfect. Almost there. Um, so. Can you see my screen now? Yes. yes. Awesome. All right, so. <clears throat> Um, thank you first for uh, inviting me to talk about AI Farms. It's a, it's a new F effort that just launched on September 1. Um, it's, it's a part of the National AI Institute's program funded by the federal government, multiple agencies, uh, NSF and uh, the USDA are the two primary funding sources in the first round, and we are primarily funded by NIFA, entirely funded by NIFA. And AI Farms stands for Artificial Intelligence for Future Agricultural Resilience Management and Sustainability, but the main idea behind it is to be able to develop novel AI capabilities and to use them in novel ways for solving important agricultural problems. So I'll say a little bit more about that in the next, the next few slides. Um, we have a number of uh, partners involved, four universities, so Illinois, uh, the Center for Digital Agriculture in particular, which I'm a co-director of, as well as uh, the University of Chicago, uh, Michigan State University, and Tuskegee University. We also have a nonprofit lab, Donald Danforth Plant Science Center, and we have uh, a couple of researchers from a local USDA agricultural research station um, who've been enormously successful in, in environmental resilience research, for example, and um, Argon Labs, uh, which has uh, shared personnel with the University of Chicago. And we have three companies that have also partnered with us in the early development of the proposal, and Microsoft was very much one of them. So Ranbir Chandra um, was part of the team, and so were Hendrik Haman from IBM and and uh, Chin Besoman from EarthSense, who some of you actually know, I think. Um, so this is a quick overview of the leadership team. I won't spend too much time on this, except to say we have a, an associate director for technology transfer and industry management, Supratik Guha, uh, on the left here. He used to be at IBM before he joined Sh University of Chicago. He's a very successful engineering researcher and uh, three associate directors for research. Um, Todd Mockler, Girish Chaudhary, and Alex Schwing, who span agriculture, robotics, and computer vision. And uh, we have an explicit associate director for technology adoption and public policy, Madhu Khanna. Well, she's a very well respected ag economist. And this is an important uh, emphasis for us is, is how we can use public policy uh, uh, techniques to be able to incentivize farmers and production act technologies. Um, especially AI driven technologies. We also have a major effort in education and outreach. Uh, there are uh, two current bachelor's degrees uh, in, digital, in the digital agriculture space, one in computer science plus crop sciences, one in computer science plus animal sciences, and we're going to be adding um, AI content to that and working with those degrees. And we're also developing a new professional master's degree in digital agriculture. And Tiffany uh, runs a on-ramp program to bring in non-computer science specialists who have bachelor's degrees in other this other areas like English or history or or agri in uh, crop sciences or, or agriculture and give them enough of a computer science training that they could actually do a whole master's degree in computer science. It's a really interesting program and she has just started that program this semester. So she's also our associate director for education. Um, at a very high level and I'm, I have to say before I go further that this is a really 20,000 foot overview of the, the motivating challenges and the goals. This is why we think AI can help, but um, I'll just take you through this fairly quickly. I'm, I want to be conscious of time. Um, 
broadly, we think that there are two fundamental reasons why agriculture faces challenges in productivity and sustainability um, and so on. And one of them is that um, because of limited labor availability, people make um, no uh, environmentally harmful decisions like large use of fertilizer and herbicide and others. And if we could instead have autonomous, low cost mobile systems like teams of robots, we could, um, supported by sensors and drones and edge computing, we could make a significant difference in the effectiveness of the same number of people, but managing large uh, farms. And in livestock, uh, where, uh, where uh, labor availability is actually a serious problem these days. The second are enormously varied, both in terms of the kinds of sensors that produce the data and also in terms of the scales, spatial scales and temporal scales. And so you really need novel, more powerful machine learning capabilities to be able to deal with this diverse heterogeneous data sources. So those are the two reasons why we think AI can make a real difference. And um, we spent a lot of time really identifying where AI could have an impact and where AI itself would need further research. Um, in other words, we want to advance both AI and agriculture. So we've chosen four broad research thrusts, and I'll take you through them um, clockwise starting from the left. So the first one is autonomous farming, and in particular, uh, like I said earlier, the use of low cost mobile robots combined with sensors, edge computing and drones in order to make to do a number of to address a number of challenges where uh, robots can make a difference. And I'll say a little bit more about this um, in a couple of slides. The second is um, labor optimization for livestock health and welfare, in particular to, to somewhat reduce the need for labor, but to also improve the outcomes for animal health and animal welfare. Third is environmental resilience, in particular, how crops can be more, res more uh, resilient to climate change effects like elevated ozone and others. And the fourth is uh, monitoring soils um, to improve soil health um, of agriculture. And um, uh, we've identified a number of foundational AI research goals that require advances in order to enable these different uh, directions. And we also have a significant workforce development effort to uh, develop people trained in advanced AI capabilities also. And this is aimed at professional, the professional workforce of working people already, uh, in companies especially. Um, I probably don't have the time to take you through uh, the foundational AI research goals, so I'll just, um, maybe I'll just enumerate them briefly, but uh, some of you may already be familiar with some of these problems. Um, the point here is that these problems come up in many, many different domains, not just in agriculture, um, but advancing the state of the art in these areas can improve the quality of solutions that we develop in agriculture and, and other domains. So um, the six foundational goal challenges we identified are the small data problem, the fact that some uh, labeled data sets are very, very expensive or difficult to obtain in domains like agriculture and many other um, uh, areas of human effort. The second is heterogeneous information fusion. I already mentioned this one earlier. The third is that machine learning models today tend to be very black box and really do not incorporate any kind of domain or much domain knowledge at all. And if we're able to add, incorporate, integrate domain knowledge with machine learning, we could make more explainable and also more effective learning uh, techniques. The third is federated learning at the edge. This is both to improve privacy preserving analysis of data, but also to be able to do, for example, lower cost, low latency decision making in teams of robots and drones cooperating with each other. The fifth is learning to control autonomous systems. So techniques like model based reinforcement learning that can be used in closed loop systems to control autonomous vehicles or autonomous systems. And the sixth is anytime that you have people interacting with autonomous systems, um, whether it's livestock management or whether it's uh, robot teams, you really need to have explainable AI and you need to uh, give humans the ability to understand and also control the autonomous capabilities. And that's a broad problem, uh, again, that we aim to tackle. 
And the idea is that we're going to be doing research in these six areas. The AI people on the team are going to be doing research in these areas, but we're also going to be collaborating then with the ag researchers to use these techniques to solve problems in the agricultural domains. And um, I won't take you through all the different ag problems that we plan to tackle. I'll spend a little bit of time on autonomous farming because that's one area where we're planning to use farm beats in the early days, but um, there's I have much more information on the other th uh, four th uh, three thrusts as well. Um, we have several experimental sites. Um, I'm going to skip this slide largely, but um, I'll mention the autonomous, the Illinois Autonomous Farm is a small facility that we're developing here on the Illinois campus, um, funded by multiple projects, and uh, this uh, AI Farms Institute is one of them, where we are planning to use uh, farm beats, as I said earlier. So the Illinois Autonomous Farm um, is going to be, uh, we started operating it this year, so it's at a very early stage, but it is, we did have our first production season this year uh, using, uh, to do, do doing some experiments with autonomous technologies. And uh, Girish Chaudhary, who is a robotics researcher and also has a startup company um, called EarthSense, their company donated, um, it's actually five robots now, the slide says four, but these robots are pictured here on the center of the screen, and they really are a major foundation for this autonomous farm. We're uh, using um, these robots. We're also, uh, we've uh, uh, done one round of initial experiments this season, um, and I'll say a little bit more about this as well. We're also starting to use Microsoft Farm Beach sensor hubs here, although we have not yet started gathering data with that, but I'll say more about what the plans are in a moment, but but uh, EarthSense, Microsoft, John Deere, and IBM are the main collaborators here. The main goals of this thrust are um, actually in the center bottom here. So we want to be able to use low cost autonomous robots to enable more sustainable, more profitable, more productive uh, production farming. And this includes a variety of uh, specific goals such as phenotyping, automated phenotyping to measure plant properties uh, under the canopy uh, using vision and other sensors. Um, herbicide free mechanical weeding because uh, many weeds in the Midwest and in the US in general are becoming resistant to herbicides. Um, reducing the amount of nitrogen fertilizer that's used in plants by um, essentially augmenting by putting lower quantities across entire fields and then using small amounts in, as they call, side dressing in specific areas. Um, also cover crops, which are a really important way to both preserve soils and to uh, reduce nitrogen runoff. Um, and we can reduce the cost of cover crops by enabling auto automated uh, ro uh, robots for planting. And also harvesting for uh, fruits and uh, vegetables. So. That's an experiment that we did this year as well. And there's a number of uh, foundational AI goals that are listed on the left. I won't go through them that need to be solved in order to make these uh, address these kinds of challenges. Um, there's a short video here. I'm going to skip this video. It shows maybe I'll just show the first few seconds of the video. You can see the Terra Sentia robot navigating between rows of crops under the canopy here and it has cameras, LIDAR and other sensors mounted on it. And that video data can be used to measure plant widths. It can be used to measure crop. Uh, so for example, corn heads and biomass, you can see it identifying the crop heads there. Um, so that's the Terra Sentia robots. We also did an experiment with harvesting and picking with um, hybrid arms that have a combination of flexible and, and hard uh, components for um, fruits and berries. Um, I hope you saw the, a little bit of a clip there. And then we also did an experiment. This is on the autonomous farm itself. Um, the robot was adapted with a with a planter. So you can see uh, the box containing about 25 pounds of seed and it's dispersing the seed between the crops for cover crops. And the idea is that if you can do this, you can really bring down the cost of planting cover crops in uh, before harvest in the field. So that's a real video of a uh, experiment that, that was done here at the autonomous farm. We've installed a farm beat sensor hub on the farm. 
uh, this season and we plan to install a few more as well. We have not yet gathered, started gathering data with this, but um, you can see a small map on the right which shows the uh, farm. It's about a five acre farm and we have an option for 10 more acres just at the bottom of the screen uh, that is partly cut off. And the idea is that by dispersing these sensor hubs across this field, um, we'll be able to use this both for environment monitoring. So the initial installation has soil temperature, ambient temperature and pressure uh, uh, gathering sensors. And we also plan to use this for underground soil monitoring by burying soil sensor boxes under the soil, working with a team from the University of Chicago. And then uh, there is some potential to use TV white space for robot to robot wireless communication for teams of robots navigating the space on uh, an autonomous farm. And those are some things that we plan to or, or plan to look into next year as we make progress on the autonomous farm itself. Um, so I have a summary slide with some broad goals for technology in agriculture, but perhaps in the interest of time, I should stop there and take any questions that people may have. This is my last slide. Hello, can you hear me? Hey, Vikram, thank you. That was sure. great. Um, just curious with the AI farm and this effort, how many years are you looking out? Like how long is the project um, currently yeah. funded? And what are your like? Yeah, how long will the AI farm sort of right, last? Right. right. So um, I didn't really uh, have time to go into all that, but it is a twenty million dollar effort for five years, and uh, so it's about four million dollars per year. Mm -hmm. But some of these activities we hope will become longer lived. So, for example, the autonomous farm is an independent activity that we are developing with multiple research projects and, and uh, contributions from multiple teams. Um, and many of the individual thrusts as well, we expect will develop um, new sources of funding and industry collaborations. And so we hope that many of the components of the AI farms effort will continue and evolve and, and uh, probably I'm sure change over time, but they will become longer lived efforts. Excellent. Um, oh, Hakeem is using the hand raising feature. Very good. <laughs> Hakeem. <laughs> Very polite. Yeah, <laughs> I'm testing out the different Teams features. Yep. Vikram, uh, uh, this is awesome. Uh, Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, just a couple questions. Uh, yeah. One, is this is this like a center where it's renewable or is it only five years and that's, and that's it? You know, it's not entirely clear to me. I have seen uh, I've seen some literature saying that it might be renewable, but not official enough to know for sure. Um, I think that there's a possibility that it would be renewed after five years. Um, I think to some extent this whole program on National AI Institutes is at a very early stage. Uh, this was the first year, in fact, and the second round is ongoing right now. So. I think it's evolving and we'll find out more over the next probably couple of years or so. But it's intended to be a long term program. Whether it, existing ones will be renewed or not, I don't know. OK, good. And then the um, yeah, with your six pillars or whatnot, uh, that's uh -huh. interesting. And I want to ask about the federated learning. Uh, yeah, who who are the people involved with that? Yeah. I like it. It's, it involves like distributed systems and bit yeah. of theory and stuff like that. Absolutely, uh, right. It's very interesting. Thanks, yep. Yeah, so um, we have people on our team who are the mo more of the AI experts. So Sanmi Koejo is uh, a federated learning and, and more broadly a machine learning uh, faculty member in computer science. Um, I'm working on the edge computing component of that with Sanmi. And then uh, Indy Gupta is not officially on the team, but he works closely with Sanmi and he's the uh, distributed uh, Computing person, um, you might actually know India. I don't know, but well, yeah, uh, yes. no, I know I know him very well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's what I thought. So anyway, uh, so Indy Sanmi have been working together on this for quite a while, and I'm actually just starting to work with them on the AI on, on the edge computing part of this. Okay, yeah, 
Oh, and Frankfurt. Paris. I'm sorry, I left out Paris. Paris Maragdes, who is a uh, machine learning for signals and signal processing, um, is also working with us on this. Okay, yeah, I may follow up with you a little bit on that. Yeah, right. Eddie's from Cornell, so I know <laughs> he's very much a Cornell person. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so is Ranveer, and uh, in fact, I think they know each other as well. Yeah. Well, yeah. No, I think that they overlap most of the time here. Yeah, exactly. They have the same advisor, if I remember right. Ken uh, well, maybe not. Maybe not. Yeah, no, no, you're right. Yeah, no, you're right. Yeah, I, was it Ken? I forgot that. Yeah, but both of them are Ken. Yeah, yeah, Ken's advisor, both. Right. All right. Uh, Kim, did you have any other questions? Because uh, Stephen also wanted to ask. No, a I, question. That was it. Thank you. All right, Stephen. Thanks, Elizabeth, and thank you, Vikram. It's very exciting to hear about your project. As Akeem said, congratulations to you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, this is great that um, Stacey and Elizabeth pair your project with the project that Phoebe is leading, and we're going to talk about in a few minutes. Um, yep. We, on that project, um, takes a, uh, I, I would say, a critical position uh, on uh, historical processes and patterns of agricultural modernization. And uh -huh. I'm interested in how you and the development of your project engaged or, or didn't engage with these critical concerns about how technological change historically has, um, in my view, uh, not resolved problems of uh, economic and social and ecological contradictions of agriculture. And I would say that there's a, a significant risk that AI and digital agriculture broadly defined will continue to reinforce existing problematic patterns, or at least say, we could say has have some negative spillovers and we don't have to discuss whether it's net negative or net positive. But how did those negative aspects of technological change and displacement um, and economic consolidation and disruptive uh, innovation. How did that play out in your development of this project? So, so that's a very broad question, and um, I'll make a first attempt at answering that here, but I would love to talk about it in much more detail with you because to me, this is a major concern for us. It's something that we have uh, thought about, we've discussed. Um, so First, let me say that we are trying to use, we're trying to uh, uh, use technology to solve problems that can have a, a beneficial impact on um, a few things. So on the environment, on human health, on, uh, on uh, labor um, especially, um, and I, that, that doesn't mean that there are any guarantees in in uh, this kind of effort, um, but it is at least something that we've put quite a bit of thought into. So, for example, when we, if I can go back to the thrusts here, when we talked about autonomous farming, there's a common misconception that we are talking about reducing, um, uh, basically replacing human workers with with machines on uh, on crops uh, for crop farming and that's not really the case i think that the current situation for example is that uh, a small a small uh, teams of farmers whether it's small whether it's family farms or whether it's professionally managed farms you have small teams of farmers managing enormous uh, amounts of land uh, thousands of acres of farmland and the only way they're able to do that is by using large-scale machines like harvester, uh, harvesters and combines and tractors and making decisions that tend to be in most cases spread out across entire large areas rather which which can greatly in, uh, increase the amount of usage for example of, of uh, nitrogen fertilizer or herbicides or other problems and if instead we could have the ability to have hundreds of workers on those farms 
for a, instead of just small teams of four or five people managing them, you could do much more detailed, much more precise monitoring of, of plant health, much more um, specific usage of nitrogen in different areas. Um, you could do much greater, much more precise management of weeds. The idea behind autonomous farming is that we don't have that amount of labor availability today for these row crops. And so what we want to be able to do is to is to um, augment the capabilities of farmers today to achieve much more sustainable outcomes, environmentally conscious outcomes that have uh, much, uh, much less negative deleterious effects on human health. Um, a second one is weeding. So for example, today there's indiscriminate spraying of herbicides to kill weeds. And it's a real problem for both en the environment and human health. And um, by uh, replacing uh, chemical weeding with mechanical weeding, it can make a real difference in terms of both the environment and human health. Also, um, with livestock, the story is a little bit different. So there, there um, you know, animal farms today really do face a serious shortage of, of labor. By coincidence, I happen to be on a, on a swine farm, a pig farm, just yesterday, um, about an hour north of here. And the two most important problems they talk about are disease and labor availability. And if we're able to use autonomous uh, non-invasive sensors like uh, cameras and temperature sensors and sound, driving autonomous systems for monitoring, you could imagine getting much better outcomes for animal health and welfare without with somewhat reduced usage um, requirement of labor. And then environmental resilience again is an area where our emphasis really has been on how crops can, well, there's actually two directions there. One is on how crops can be much more tolerant of climate change effects. And a second, which, by, which Illinois is a major stronghold and we've had enormously positive, uh, successful research in that area. And a second one is how cropping, modern cropping practices can be less harmful to the environment. So for example, nitrogen runoff and hypoxic zones in rivers in the Gulf of Mexico are a serious problem in the US. And nitrogen runoff is a major challenge there. And so both nitrogen and phosphorus. And so um, um, the environment due to the use of nu uh, nutrients is a, a, a major goal in the Environmental Resilience Trust and also in the Soil Health Trust. So I am very much aware that technology may have negative effects, ha both harmful and, and beneficial effects. I think the best that we can do is to try and identify ways in which they, it can help and then put in place incentives to have them adopted more easily by farmers. That's a really critical piece as well, and technology adoption is a major area of emphasis for our center. In fact, we have an associate director, uh, Madhu Khanna, whose work and who's had a lot of experience in this area. She's a very well-respected um, ag economist, and she's an associate director for technology adoption and public policy for exactly this reason. So, um, sorry, I, that was a long answer. Um, <laughs> But as I said, I think this is an important topic and I would love to talk more. Postdoctoral advisor was Madhu's doctoral advisor at Berkeley. So there's a connection there. Oh, great. Okay. <laughs> All right. Vikram, thank you so much for the presentation and overview. I know there was another question. Um, what I'd like to propose is that we um, move to our next speaker. Um, this is actually a great segue for our next speaker, Cornell. Um, and then come back to any other questions um, at, if we still have time at the end of the session. But thank you, Vikram. And again, congratulations on the AI Institute Award. That's really exciting. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. All right. Uh, so we're going to turn this over to Phoebe, who's going to talk about the Cornell team's work on uh, the social impact. It's a great segue. Yeah. Phoebe. Yeah. Thank you guys for this chance to talk about our research and also thank you Vikram for making it such a great segue into what we want to talk about today. Sure, so my name is Evie Sayers. I'm a professor at Cornell and what I want to talk to you guys about today is a new NSF project that we're just launching to explore the social impact of network farming and to develop design and policy recommendations to improve that social impact. 
Um, there are three PIs involved on this project. We met through uh, work, or didn't necessarily need, but started collaborating through the Cornell Initiative for Digital Agriculture. Um, and we were all interested from different disciplinary perspectives in how agriculture was going to change based on new networking infrastructure and looking for ways to help to improve um, the long term view of how that would land in society. So um, the three PIs on the project are me, Hakeem and Steven were all on this call. Hakeem is currently building new network infrastructure based on farm beats. Uh, Stephen uh, is a sociologist of agricultural technology and his specialty is in understanding organizational changes related to agricultural information, among other things. And I work in human computer interaction. Um, a lot of my work's around design for social impact. I'm also working on a book project on the impact of infrastructure on rural communities. And we figured combining these lenses and putting our heads together, we could better understand the implications of the research that's happening today and inform design and policy tomorrow. Um, could we go to the next slide, please? The process that we're using is to integrate social science and technical research, and this is through four steps. The first is um, social scientists working with the technical researchers to understand the design space of farm networking and how uh, the farming applications are being imagined that would build on that infrastructure and to reflect that back to researchers so that we can think about um, what's going on together. The second step is to identify analogous technologies, things that already exist in the world that are uh, that share some characteristics with current technical research to see what happens to these technologies when they're actually released into organizational, cultural and economic realities that currently exist. And um, then to use those uh, the, that awareness to create representations of how the technology that's building on current technical research might be adopted in the future. Finally, we'll use these representations collaboratively to generate new design and policy recommendations for this um, technology. So our current research, next slide please. Our current research involves uh, participant observation, which is grounded in Hakeem's software defined farm project. That's a project which is building networking abstractions over farm beats. And what we're doing is uh, following Hakeem and his students around and trying to understand how technical researchers are framing the possibilities and potential of this new networking technology, what kind of design space people are working in and factors that affect how decisions are made and understanding what farm, what farm applications of this technology are thought to look like. And this work is deeply collaborative and some of you may know Glar, who's one of Hakim's students, who is a technical researcher or from the point of view of this work, but he's also doing an interview study with um, some of you in the Farm Beats community to start answering some of these questions. So um, this really is a, a deep collaboration and that's one of the things we find really exciting about this work. Um, we're doing this work through what uh, ethnographers like to call deep hanging out. So following the Weatherspoon group around and getting to understand better the kinds of venues and conversations that researchers in the group are taking part in. And that brings us to our ask for you guys. Next slide, please. So while our work is centered in the software design farm project to really understand what's happening with contemporary farm networking deeply, we would like to follow SDF into the Farm Beats community and to extend our field work into this group. Um, what we would like to do is to understand how Farm Beats is being discussed and understood in community meetings and to support the Farm Beats user community in reflecting on these social impact issues and how they might come up in your own work. Our goal is really to do this research in a way that's helpful to everybody that's mutually beneficial. So we hope this work will not only be useful to Hakeem and his group, but also for Microsoft and larger Farm Beats community. Um, in my experience doing this kind of work, it's particularly useful for rethinking problem definitions um, to start thinking about what kinds of problems we're tackling in a little bit different way that can lead to innovative technical outcomes. 
So in my prior project that I led on uh, data analytics together with a technical researcher at Cornell and with a private corporation, um, the PhD student who was on that work, Samir Passi, um, eventually ended up uh, really changing the trajectory of the technical research being done. And the company that I was working on actually gave him a job offer because they thought that the work was so valuable to them, but he wants to stay in academia. So we have a track record of seeing that this is actually useful and we hope to bring that to you. So what would this actually look like? Next slide, please. So um, it's really important to us that this work is uh, done in a way that is comfortable, not disruptive and actually productive for everybody involved. Um, this is a starting proposal of what we might do based on uh, some best practices from social science and early discussions with Elizabeth and Stacy and Ron Beer. So the basic idea is that members of our team would be involved in community uh, meetings, take notes, take screenshots of presentations, not take screenshots of people. Um, we would make sure there was a brief reminder at every meeting so that newcomers are aware of what's going on, aren't surprised to discover that somebody's taking notes on what they're doing. That reminder could be on the splash screen at the start of the meeting. It could be in the meeting announcement email, for example. We would like to provide an easy opt out mechanism so that if somebody comes into the meeting and says, I don't want to be part of this, that they can easily contact somebody. And in those cases where people opt out from research, what we do is um, we just don't take any notes on anything that they say or do. Um, that just ends up being a little blank in our field notes. So we have the infrastructure to be able to deal with that. In publications, we would not identify any of the individuals in the meeting by name or position. We would not use direct quotes or screenshots. And in both cases, we would only do these things if explicit permission had been given by the individual. So just being in a meeting wouldn't cause you to suddenly become identified. We would ask you first what you think about it and you could opt in or not, as the case may be. I don't know if one thing that's really important to us is to be able to give back to the community by reporting out what we're finding and being available for discussion of these issues also in your projects. So I already had some thoughts with Vikram's project. I'll be happy to contact you about that. That's not part of my research. That's just me as a human. Um, uh, but we really look forward to hearing your thoughts and seeing what you think would be useful and comfortable for you in this context. Uh, one last slide. I just want to. I'd, I'd love to um, introduce my team, most of which are on this call. So, so as you can see, we're a broadly interdisciplinary group and we're really interested in working with you. So I look forward to hearing uh, your feedback. Thank you, Phoebe, this is great. Um, I wanted to open it up for questions or any additional comments from the project team. I don't have a question, but maybe I can make a quick comment. I'd, I'd be very happy to talk to you some more. I, I would actually both like to participate, but also uh, like to get more detailed input from you all on how you think we can make sure that the research that we are doing in AI farms is going to have more positive and fewer negative effects, obviously. So, I'd love to work with you I'd on very that. Much like to do that. Great. Thanks. That's great. Um, any other questions or uh, <clears throat> comments? Of course, Phoebe, um, would you be willing to share your slides? We can circulate those. Oh, um, absolutely. Yeah. With the group afterwards. Thank you. Yeah, I'm just curious. Just, I mean, you mentioned this before, but they may not have caught on to it. Stephen, Hakeem, um, any of the other project members, is there anything you'd like to add to what I said? No, I'll say that I am interested in following up with Vikram to get more information about how Madhu and the larger team is engaging the same questions that you put on the table, Phoebe. And maybe one other comment. Uh, Guar has emailed um, much of you. So if you see or have seen an email from him, please respond and eagerly um, meet with him. <laughs> Thank you. I already did an interview with him. There? Yeah, I've already talked to Groar and it was very interesting and hopefully he found it useful. And um, 
Hi, Mark. And Stephen, yeah, I would very much uh, like to talk to you more. And also, I think perhaps have you talked directly with Madhu and her uh, group working on the technology adoption and public policy topics? Yeah. O only um, through Jonathan Coppice and um, I'm blanking on another colleague in agricultural economics. So no, I need to reach out to Madhu, but uh, I'll let Phoebe, because she's the leader of this effort, that so I, I propose that we have some ongoing uh, discussion and see where that takes us. So thank you for your interest. Gladly. Yeah. <coughs> and if you need introductions, you know how to find me. Hopefully. <laughs> great. All right. Thank you so much, Phoebe, um, for the presentation. That was great. Um, so I wanted to use our remaining we have about 10 minutes left um, and actually turn it over to Andrew. Andrew, um, are you able to do video? Not sure if you. There, I got my video back. You did. Excellent. <laughs> so, great to see Hello. you. So um, I know you had a question about the AI farm, so please feel free to bring that up um, for Vikram. And then um, we had asked if you could just give a little bit of a preview of some of the work that you're going to talk about um, in our next meeting um, based on what you did this summer at your at the farm. Yeah, so at our farm this uh, harvest, I just finished harvest last Wednesday. Thank goodness. <laughs> um, I installed some lower cost um, video sensors around our farm to try to be able to more automatically track my trucks um be able to kind of have a two-part thing have it be um reduce human error and also uh increase social distancing unfortunately <laughs> my uh covid tail is longer than needs to be but uh, i didn't get the time to reduce the social distancing as much as i wanted uh um due to uh child care issues but uh what i did end up getting is a lot of data to be able to roll that on and hopefully next year reduce that human error so i have uh, mounted some cameras um they stream to my edge device uh which right now is located in my house uh i also purchased a remote scale with a larger display um where i can have these cameras pointing and the idea is is that i will be able to move it to different locations some of our bins uh, all of them have power but some do not have great internet some do not have uh, any weighing facilities uh, and this will be automatically weighing and tracking all of the grain that comes from my field into my home storage automatically so that way it reduces the error of of my uh, truck drivers um, there's still the origin issue where some of our fields, we actually load another field uh, that I'm working through, but uh, got a lot of information. Then I'll have a, a demo next month for um, how it's actually reading the truck going on uh, using pretty standard out of the box uh, AI tools uh, with Microsoft. And then the next part is going to be my TV white space bin monitoring. So. Uh, we're working on getting the box here. Um, I'm working with Zarina on that. Um, I have a canola bin. I need to watch the temperatures in it closely. Um, there are currently bin monitoring solutions. They are pretty prohibitive in their price. So what a lot of my neighbors have been doing, they manually go and you know check the temperature of the bin uh, just with a analog uh, temperature, you know, probe. They go in, they they check it, you know, usually every few days or at least once a week. Uh, you just don't want the temperature imbalance gain too great. Canola can either cause spoilage or it can cause it to overheat. And I really don't want to have a bitten fire. <laughs> so uh, I will be uh, placing TV white space on the bin. I have tried LoRa. Um, for some reason, my corrugated metal just messes with LoRa enough where the connection is not stable at all. Um, it keeps dying. Um, I tried it last year uh, with a bin with garbanzos. I barely got it to work. I had to move my box about 15 or 20 feet away. And then I kept worrying about somebody running into my box with a truck. Um, 
so this year it'll be mounted on the top of my bin. I'll have the probe go down into it, and uh, and we'll be connecting it up with TD White Space to be able to monitor that. And then it can even you know turn on. I uh, since we just have uh, normal uh, plugins for our fans, I'm able to just run it with a, a cheap off the shelf uh, internet switch fan. So it's just uh, a standard. Falcon Wemo switch, um, so I can check it and then I can turn it on. Uh, so the total parts for that should be way less than the quote that I got for my bin, which was five thousand at the low end and twenty thousand at the high end. Which for my first crop of canola this year, I didn't really feel like doing that big of an investment. <laughs> yeah, and I'm a cheap farmer, so I guess. Uh, <laughs> I'll be doing research to remember how cheap most of these farmers are. At least the ones that stay around longer. There are some that aren't cheap, but they don't seem to stay around as long. I was going to ask, <laughs> is there any other kind? For the ones that don't stay <laughs> Their longevity is not, not necessarily the greatest. So the key is um, the and then Vikram, I was going to ask about the, I think your project sounds amazing um and i think as, as i think about the evolution of my farm um one of the things that really makes me about being able to have more autonomous uh equipment is not to reduce my labor load but to make it more possible to make my farm more flexible um because as uh farm leases come and go based off of multitudes of factors you know somebody marries a farmer and so then they want you know to farm some of the land that you're leasing or or maybe you're wanting to slowly downsize your farm some or you have family members coming back and you're wanting to increase your farm size some i definitely run into the issue of uh with my large equipment such as my sprayer my sprayer in my area can handle about eight thousand acres the problem is, is I don't want to grow in 8,000 acre chunks. Units. So this year, yeah, this year is at 9,500 acres. It made it very difficult to get everything sprayed on time because I was just past that limit. Um, but I'm not going to go and invest in another $500,000 sprayer. Um, I'm using some drone sprayers. Um, just one now. I'm hoping that I can get a swarm. Uh, waiver to run it uh, more than one next year but that was my thought to help with that limit on that piece of equipment but it is something that I'm very interested in and it's a real world scenario that happens to a lot of farmers farm sizes some farms are lucky where their size stays the same but that's kind of unlucky because the the dynamic uh, mm -hmm. your farm to be dynamic is very beneficial and uh, and I think that something like that allows that to be more dynamic and allows your farm to then go into some of these more specialty um, areas yeah. Yeah. And, and a little bit higher value, yeah. um, make it work better for farmers. Yeah. So. so that's interesting. I have not heard that particular motivation for low cost um, smaller scale systems like ro small robots and drones before, but it makes a lot of sense. Um, and I think that with some additional advances, so um, for example, on the drone side, there's been some really good research on how you could have a small number of drones cover a fairly large area by cooperatively mapping out different paths across the system, across the area, and maximize uh, battery usage, for example, um, which would allow you to cover areas in a, in a limited amount of time. Um, I'm also curious to hear, perhaps we don't have time today and maybe we should do a follow up call if you have the time at some point. I'd love to hear more about the kinds of specific problems that you would like to tackle with this because um, so for example, are there things that could be done on the ground beneath the canopy versus with uh, drones above overhead? Um, also, are you interested in cover crops and is cover crops something that you've considered using on the farm. I don't know if you do that already, but um, cover cropping is another thing that uh, so cover cropping and weeds are two perhaps of the 
uh, most immediate likely areas where I think the technology could be ready for use. And yeah. so it's something that uh, would be interesting to hear from you. What do you think of, of uh, those kinds of directions as well? Yeah, um, in our area, I, I want to try cover cropping and a couple people have tried it. The hardest part is our driest time is August and September. And then we don't get the rains until October usually. And by yeah. that time, um, it starts to get colder. So our cover crops yeah. never really cover anything. Don't um, take. OK, yep, yep. So would you be willing to spend yeah. the next? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Would you be willing to spend, uh, maybe take a little bit more time for, not right now, but I mean in a follow up and have a conference call to talk about this in more detail. And I'd like to invite Girish, the person who leads the robotics work and maybe one or two other people to talk to you and, and hear, just hear some more about what you uh, are, looking, are interested in. Yeah, that'd be great. That'd be fa fabulous, thank you. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks for the update. Les, did you do an irrigation project this summer in addition to the other two you mentioned? Yes, yeah, I did a spart irrigation on my orchard. Uh, so I will be pressing cider from my apples hopefully in a week from that. And uh, and then hopefully doing a little side uh, hard cider. <laughs> right. Can we put in uh, requests for, for like Hannah that. shows that with the group, right? <laughs> yeah. Let's ship one for our next virtual meeting and we'll all enjoy. Right. Just a few regulatory hurdles on that one. <laughs> <laughs> Minor issues. Stacy, was there anything else that uh, you wanted to mention before we sign off? I think that's all we had on our agenda for today. And as usual, I'll take the video and post it on our YouTube channel and send everybody the link. I'll also take Phoebe's document and I'll post it out on our team site. And you can all find a link to that on our general page in the team's channel. And then this was the last month that we had our meeting um, scheduled through. So I'll be sending out another meeting invitation for our monthly community forums for uh, probably October, November and December and the intention would be we'll move those back to Thursdays. So if anybody has a conflict, a continued conflict on Thursday, obviously we want everyone to be able to attend the meetings in person. So if you don't like Thursdays kind of towards the end of the month, let me know and then I can look to pull the group to find better dates or days of the week and times that work best for everyone. Awesome. That sounds great. Well, thank you everyone for joining us. And we'll see you next time. See you all next time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone.